there, I've told this story before, but uh, there is a, uh, there was an atheist who moved into this neighborhood right next to an elderly Christian woman, and he began to get annoyed because what would happen is every morning, this elderly woman would go out into the front porch, and she would just pray loud. She would praise loud. She would worship loud. She would pray loud, and she would just pray about anything and everything, and so one day, she went out there, and she was praying praying for groceries. She was like, Lord, I really need some groceries and money's tight right now. Please provide. And, and so the atheist thought, well, I'm going to show her a thing or two. So he went to the grocery store the next morning and he grabbed a bunch of groceries and, and he put it on her front porch. And he's like, I'm going to show her that, you know, that God's not real. So he put it in front of her front porch and he hid behind a bush. And this old lady, sure enough, well, you know, woke up in the morning and first thing she did, she came out to the porch and she looked at all the groceries and she looked up and she said, wow, God, thank Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for providing these groceries. God, you are so awesome. And the atheist jumps out of the bush and says, ha ha, God didn't provide those groceries. I paid for them. And the old lady looks up to the sky and says, and thank you, Heavenly Father, because you made the devil pay for it. <laughs> he did an act of kindness that he was not aware of. This morning's topic is on kindness. We have been in a series called Summer Gardens, and if you've been following us uh, throughout this series, it's actually been pretty amazing because we have been able to have uh, various people from inside our church, our elders and staff, uh, come before you and, and minister the word and really bring about different aspects of what we're uh, of what the Bible calls the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. And so, if you have missed any of these installments in this series, please go and check out our YouTube channel uh, podcast uh, through Apple or Spotify, and that way you can catch up. But also, so you can have an opportunity to kind of hear from. Uh, Pastor Danny and Pastor Andy and Kat and uh, the amazing way that the Lord has used them. In fact, one thing we were talking about uh, was, you know, it was, it's fascinating to see uh, how each of them were given one aspect of the fruit and how it just matched them, you know, so well. And so uh, like when Pastor Danny, he, he, had, he was talking about gentleness and how he delivered it so gently. Didn't you guys love that? And I thought about today's topic. I'm like, well, I don't know how kind I'm going to be, but... Uh, we'll see how this goes. And so pray for me, y'all. <laughs> I'll pray for you. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm just excited because this has been an incredible series. And really, throughout the series, we've given sort of three frameworks on why this is so important. Why is the fruit of the Spirit important? And, and if you remember, the first thing that we said is, well, because uh, it validates our credibility of our witness, the spirit of the fruit validates the credibility of our witness. It, it validates the fact that, that, uh, that we are producing fruit that attract people to Christ instead of retract people from him. That we want to be attractive and not retractive, right? Number two is that the spirit's fruit validates the genuineness of our faith. There have been several times where people have come to me and, and in deep angst or worry or even fear, uh, you know, they, they lay in bed at night sometimes thinking about this or sometimes it comes up in thought and am I really saved and, you know, what, what if I stand before, you know, God and, and I'm not or, you know, how do I know? And the great thing is that one way to know is that it's through the fruit of the Spirit and so it validates the genuineness of our faith. And lastly, the Spirit's fruit is in conflict with the works of the flesh. In other words, if if there is conflict going on inside of you, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Sometimes when people come to me and they talk about the struggles that they're internally battling with, um, the, one of the things I do is I pause and I say, well, let's just praise God that there's a struggle, that you are fighting, that, that it's not something that you've just kind of succumbed to or that you don't even notice or isn't even a pain point, but that there is a struggle, that there is a battle. There, there's something within you. The, the, the fruit of the Spirit is, is battling against the works of your flesh, and so there's a internal battle between flesh and fruit and flesh and fruit and sometimes you end up on the side of flesh and sometimes you end up on the side of fruit and I don't know it just depends right on your day and how you've been if you had a snack or whatever but we we pray through and there's this conflict that happens and so those are kind of the three frameworks by which we've been going throughout this entire series on why this is so 
important. And we've been anchoring um, really this message in Galatians chapter 5. And, and it's not that this is the only place where it talks about fruit. Paul in several places talks about how uh, the, God wants us to produce much fruit. And, but here he gives uh, really a, a good description on what that fruit is. And just, and I know we've said this a few weeks now, but just so we can really just drill it in, that you know, this is one fruit. It, it, it's not plural, it's one fruit. And so it's different characteristics of the one fruit or aspects or attributes, right? Think of it almost like a diamond uh, for those of you in the room that are jewelers, because I know we have a lot of jewelers in the room. Um, when you look at a diamond, the center of the diamonds, they call the table, right? But when you look at it, you can see the different facets of the diamond. You can see the different angles and, and, and the different cuts, but it's one diamond that you're looking at. And, and it's the same thing. We're looking at the different facets, attributes, characteristics, of the fruit. So if you want to turn your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to start reading in verse 22, verse 22. And it says this, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And here there is no conflict with Jewish laws. Those who belong to Christ have nailed their natural evil desires to his cross and crucified them there. If we are living now by the Holy Spirit's power, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Wow. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. I pray, Lord God, that you will be heard and seen and glorified. I pray that uh, you will allow us, Lord God, to uh, come before you humbly, Lord God, and, and produce in us everything that the Spirit wants to produce. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, the word kindness, this is really interesting because uh, that word isn't something that just sort of pops up every now and again in Scripture, but actually the concept of kindness can be found throughout all of Scripture. There's this kind of cool tool that we use, and we're going to have a video that kind of shows it to you that I think is pretty neat. And so we're going to nerd out for a little bit for those of us who are Bible nerds. Um, And so what I want to show you is uh, this diagram here, and all of those lines are all concepts of kindness kindness, the word kindness or concept that comes throughout. And so if I go to any book of the Bible, let's just say Romans here, here in Romans, it shows me how kindness is connected to Deuteronomy and 2 Samuel, or maybe, you know, we go to Genesis and we see here that it's in 1 Peter and Ephesians or Isaiah, and we see it's in Acts and Galatians, or this one's kind of cool, Revelation. And in Revelation, you see it connecting to 1 Kings and Daniel. This is all just the word Kindness, And so kindness is really found throughout all of Scripture. In other words, it's not something that's just sprinkled lightly, but it is a motif in the Bible. It is a meta-narrative, if you will, throughout Scripture. But what is it? But what is it? Ellen DeGeneres, uh, who most of us know from her show, Hilarious. She brings on different celebrities. Uh, She does games, all sorts of stuff. But she fell from her two decade long reign as the queen of kindness for apparently, well, not being kind. Kindness was her motto, right? Encouraging everyone, quote, to be kind to one another is how she would end every episode. And so she made millions selling the idea of kindness. Her brand of kindness is what led the way. And yet, in the end, it proved to be empty due to reports of the toxic, racist, racist, and abusive work culture that she set at times. And I'm not here to pick on Ellen or to say that she's this horrible person. What I'm wanting to do is demonstrate how The culture, in our culture, kindness tends to come up empty. It tends to fall short somehow. Because cultural kindness tends to lean itself more to the form of niceness than kindness, right? You're kind if you're priding yourself on tolerance or acceptance or affirmation. 
But that's not exactly what kindness is. It's almost like the word tolerance. Our culture has changed the definition of tolerance. Now tolerance means that you have to agree with everybody. And so if we don't agree, then you're not tolerating me. But actually, that doesn't mean tolerance at all. Because if we agreed, I wouldn't need to tolerate you and you wouldn't need to tolerate me. But it's when we disagree, but we can still respect each other, that tolerance comes in. Well, our culture has also sort of changed the dynamics of kindness. And and in our culture, we sort of see kindness as like these random acts, right? Random acts of kindness, you know? A type of kindness without context. Well, what I want to do is I want to show you this quote. Look at what theologian D.A. Carson says in his book, Showing the Spirit. He says this, we think of kindness without context. Of course, in our mean world, it's pleasant to be surprised by a stranger's kindness, free and random as it may seem. Sure, sprinkle that stuff everywhere. But the Christian version of kindness is far deeper, more significant, and contextualized. Christian kindness is no common courtesy or virtue in a vacuum, but it is a surprising response to mistreatment and hurt. It is not free, random or free, but it is a costly, counterintuitive response to the meanness, to outrage, rather than responding in kind, but being quick to pay back with kindness what it received in hurt. To be quick to pay back with kindness what it received in hurt. In other words, biblical kindness is an unconditional act of service that benefits and, and meets the need of another, of another. K- kindness is what we take, uh, the, what we know theologically about people. Theologically, we know that everybody's created in the image of God and therefore everybody is valuable. Kindness takes that knowledge and puts it into action. It makes it function, you see. You're treating every person with dignity and value because they have been made. You have been made. We have been made. I have been made in the image of God. Kindness. And I think maybe the greatest difference between Christian kindness and natural kindness is at the end of the day, Christian kindness always sees that there's actually a much deeper, much deeper and deeper need. That's really what it is. It's a deeper need. In other words, remember when those guys went and, and they got their friend and, and they wanted to take him to Jesus to be healed. But when they got to the house that, that Jesus was in teaching, the house was packed. So like, well, how are we going to do this? So they actually lifted him up on the guy's roof. Remember that? Yeah. And then they started like tearing the roof apart and then lowering this guy down in front of Jesus so that way Jesus can heal him physically. Y'all remember that story, yeah. right? And so here they are and they're lowering him down and, and the first thing that Jesus says to him isn't, oh, you're healed. Even though that's what the friends wanted, that's what he wanted. But, but he said, your sins are forgiven. Right. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a friend that was up there on the roof sweating, bringing this guy down to be healed. And if the first thing Jesus says was your sins were forgiven, I'd be like, listen, Jesus, we didn't bring him for that. You can obviously see his need, can't you? Oh, Jesus could see it. But see, Jesus could see the need beneath the need. You see? And yeah, Jesus eventually healed him. But, but here's the crazy thing about it is he thought, well, if I could just be healed, I'll be happy. But anybody that has been healed before knows that after you've been healed, that a few days, a few weeks, a few months, guess what? You'll find something else to stress about, something else to have anxiety about, something else to get upset about, and your happiness is gone. No, 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 no. You see, Jesus knows that his real need was salvation. His real need was the gospel. It's a need beneath the need. And true Christian kindness doesn't just meet needs at this level but it meets, it meets needs at the level that is underneath the need. It's that kind of kindness. In other words, it's a kind of kindness that we see displayed through Scripture. And my question is, what kind of kindness do you display? Do you display a cultural kind of kindness, which as the message goes on, we'll be able to see a little bit more of what that is, or do you display a biblical kind of kindness, the kind of kindness that the Holy Spirit supernaturally produces in our natural gardens? Our natural gardens means our life, our hearts, right? Is that the kind of kindness? 
what kind of kindness do you produce? And, and really, it should be this, three things, a kindness that's illuminating, a kindness that is leading, and a kindness that is liberating. A kindness that is illuminating, a kindness that is leading, and a kindness that is liberating. So we're going to go through those three this morning. Number one, a kindness that is illuminating. It's a, a kindness that is produced by the Holy Spirit. Luminates. It illuminates from Christ. Kindness isn't just the light that points to Christ, but it comes from Christ himself, you see. When Jesus came to earth, when he was born and he lived, he, he, he didn't just come, watch this, he didn't just claim to have the best explanation of God, but he claimed to be the best explanation of God. Not just to have it, but he claimed to be it. This is completely different from all other sort of religious uh, uh, spiritual leaders or gurus out there who, who would say, listen, I can show you the way to enlightenment or I can show you the way to nirvana or I can show you the way to paradise or the way to heaven. I can show you the way to those things. Jesus says, yeah, I can show you the way, but I'm more than that. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He says, I'm not just showing you the way to God. I am God, you see. And it, and it blew the minds of first century folks. Because watch this. Jesus didn't just demonstrate what God is like, but whom God likes. He didn't just demonstrate what God is like, but whom God likes. In other words, who he loves. Who he loves. And this was shocking. This was absolutely shocking to the people in the first century. You see. Because the Greek and Romans gods, well, they didn't love anybody, actually. They kind of just toyed with people, right? The Greek and Romans, God, they, they didn't care for people. And so consequently, they didn't require anyone to care. So when Jesus introduces this idea that God is a God that loves everybody, that doesn't just love Jewish people, he doesn't just love people that are nice to him, or he doesn't even just love people that worship him, but, but God loves everybody, everybody. He, 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 he doesn't even just love people that are indifferent to him, but he even loves people that hate him. Absolutely despite him. He, he doesn't just love people that deny his existence, but he loves people that fully accept his existence and hates him. Wants to kill him, wants to get rid of him, you see. Is that the kind of kindness you show and I show? Just to show the extraordinary contrast, contrast that Jesus was to his culture, we have to understand something about the culture and, and really something about the slave culture in the Roman Empire. See, there were more slaves than there were Roman citizens. All over the world, slavery was an assumption. It wasn't a social issue. It was an assumption. The, the, the economy derived benefits from slavery. Slavery, in their minds, was here to stay. It was here to stay. And a slave culture devalues everybody because everyone is just one step away from possibly becoming a slave. Just one bad luck, one horrible thing, one sad incident away from becoming a slave. See, you could be a king, a Caesar, a, you, you could be, a, a, you know, some, you could claim to be some sort of like demigod, whatever it is, and, and, and control this nation. But if another nation comes in and takes over, then you were now their slave. It didn't matter. Right? If your husband died, ladies, you could become a slave. If you were injured and you can no longer work, you could become a slave. If you couldn't pay your debts, you could become a slave. Everybody in the first century, everybody in the early century, everybody in early times was potentially somebody else's property. Nobody had intrinsic value. Well, did something happen? I think so. That's okay. Can you guys still hear me? If not, I'll really shout if the mic goes out. Okay, I think a, a, a brake switch or something went out. Okay, praise God. My TV screen is blue, so uh, my time is on there, so just wave at me if I'm going over it. Okay, praise God. Um, but everybody in the first century uh, was essentially or potentially somebody else's property and not, didn't have intrinsic value. Nobody had inherent value. And when Jesus shows up, even in the Jewish culture, guys, even in Jewish culture, the temple system had sort of devolved to a point where, where even religious leaders play to their own version of karma, to their own version of a caste system, right? They use their laws uh, to, to keep people, 
They, they use their Jewish laws to keep women and sinners and Samaritans and shepherds and lepers and the lame in their place. That's what they did. Always reminding the populace that God favored the powerful, that God favored the wealthy, that God favored those who had the resources to force their way into society, that God primarily favored the prosperous, that God primarily favored healthy men. And that poverty and illness was a sign that you were cursed or being punished by God. Or perhaps that your parents did something. That was also their thought. That maybe their parents did something and God's punishing the child because of the parent. That's why when Jesus went to the pool and he went to go heal this sick man, the, 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 the disciple says, well, wait a minute. Did he sin or did his parents sin? And Jesus said, neither. He's like this, so that way I can come and heal him to show you who I am. Oh, y'all don't want to hear that. Okay? And so, but it's so in the minds of people that that's how it was. The whole idea of kindness and compassion was completely unnecessary. Because in that world, people got what they deserved. If you were poor, you were getting what you deserved. If you were rich, you were getting what you deserved. If you were ill, you were getting what you deserved. If you were healthy, you were getting what you deserved. And then came a rabbi from Galilee. And everywhere he went, he elevated everybody's dignity. And he taught it in such a way that you began to get the impression that kindness was an expression of strength and not of weakness. And to do for someone who could never do for you, who could never repay you back, was a sign of virtue. And that being meek did not mean being weak. And that people had an inscribed value. It wasn't prescribed to them based on what they can produce for society or based on their ethnicity or based on the family they happened to be born to. It wasn't, it wasn't prescribed to them, but it was inscribed to them because they were made in the image of God. It was the, what Jesus was presenting was completely unbelievable. He gave status and dignity to the poor and to the sick. And he stunned his audience over and over again with what he taught and with what he did. <clears throat> with what he taught and with what he did. See, this is so crazy. He was telling this parable. And what he was doing was he took somebody that the Jews considered to be enemies. So much so that there were actually laws that Jews could not get within a certain distance of these types of people called Samaritans. They couldn't even get within so many feet of them. Uh, the, the, the Jews absolutely despised Samaritans. They thought they were ungodly, unholy, evil, that everything they touched would literally be cursed. They didn't talk to them. They didn't even spit in their direction. And Jesus tells a parable where he makes a Samaritan the hero versus a Jewish priest. Wow. He did something for the entire world through that parable that we are still trying to recover from. Jesus redefined what neighbor is in that parable, which we're about to read. He redefined it because then, much like now, what we end up seeing is we think neighbors, our neighbors are people that think like us, that vote like us, that look like us, and so and, and, and that have the same tax bracket as we do and, and, and have the same interests as we do and the same commonalities that we do. Those are our neighbors. And Jesus comes along and says, no, 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 those aren't your neighbors. A neighbor is anybody that has a need that you can meet. Anybody. And so look what it says here in Luke chapter 10. It says this, a Jew was going on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho and was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and money and beat him up and left him lying half dead beside the road. By chance, a Jewish priest came along and when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Then a Jewish temple assistant, who was a Levite, walked over and looked at him lying there. Actually looked at the guy and then went on. You see that? Verse 33. But a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw him, he felt deep pity. 
Kneeling beside him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with medicine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his donkey and walked along beside him until he came to an inn where he nursed him through the night. Then the next day he handed, he handed the innkeeper two $20 bills. This is obviously a modern version. And told him to take care of the man. And he says, if the bill runs higher than that, he said, I'll pay the difference the next time I'm here. Now watch, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the bandit's victim? You see what Jesus is asking? He gives three people. He gives basically the pastor, the associate pastor, pretty much what they were, right? And this evil Samaritan. And he says, out of those three, who was being neighborly? And look what he says. He says this, the man replied, the one who showed him some pity. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Wow. See, through Jesus' teachings, through what Jesus taught and through what Jesus did, it brought about a paradigm shift of what kindness actually is. Like, for instance, let's look at the trilogy of lost things. Jesus told this story of these trilogy of lost things. And in this trilogy, he basically explained to the world and to his media audience that how God views sinners. That God does not view sinners as someone to chase down and punish but to chase down and recapture their attention. That God goes after sinners not to pay them back, but to win them back. Look what he did for sick people, right? This is, this is incredible. His interactions were people were so completely unorthodox in Jesus' time. Uh, for, 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 for instance, uh, in Jesus' time, to be clean was practically to be godly, to be holy, And so the more clean you were, the more holy you were. But Jesus turns that around. And what Jesus basically says is, no, 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 dirty hands and holy heart. Dirty hands and holy heart. And so what he does is he starts to have this conversation with a Samaritan woman. Here we go, Samaritans again. The enemy. The people are evil. You didn't talk to them. You didn't go by them. And Jesus is now striking up a conversation. But not even with a Samaritan guy. Right? Not a man, with a woman who was even lower. And then not only that, you guys, he didn't stop there. He didn't just have a conversation, but the audacity. Do you know what he did? He said, listen, he said, I would like you to take your Samaritan bucket and put it down your Samaritan well and draw up your Samaritan water so I can drink from it. This lady was like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Right? He, he, he would he'd interact with people and he would interact with, with sick people, people that, 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 were so, that, that the society pushed to the side. And Jesus would not only heal sick people, he would touch them. He didn't say this. He didn't say, be healed and now I touch you. In many cases, he touched them while they were still sick. Wow. He would touch them. He would embrace them. But not only would he touch their sores and touch their eyes and touch their skin, but the most amazing thing would happen. It was a revelation that the kingdom of God had come, which was this. Not only would Jesus touch them and Jesus not get sick, but they would get well. Not only that, but he would also visit the most unusual people. Look at tax collectors, for instance. Tax collectors. I mean, nobody liked a tax collector. Tax collectors were considered immoral, sinners, ungodly, deceitful. Jews hated them and despised them. But then he goes, Jesus goes and he talks to Matthew. You guys remember Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples? Well, he wasn't always Jesus' disciples. He was a tax collector. And he goes and he invites Matthew to come follow him, to come follow him which was a complete embarrassment to Matthew's family, to Matthew's tribe, to Matthew's nation, and a complete embarrassment to the Jews, right? But not only did he invite and follow him, but he went and said, we're going to eat together. You can imagine the disciples like, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go into his house, his cootie-infested house. No way. I'm not going to you know, touch his forks and his spoons and, and, and eat off his plates. And, and, and I'm not going to do any of that. And Jesus said, oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. And then remember Zacchaeus, short Zacchaeus that was in a tree? Remember that? And Jesus sees him at the tree and says, Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Here's another tax collector. And he's calling him down and says, hey, we're going to go eat. 
You know, and Peter's like, here we go again. What are we doing, Jesus? No wonder the Pharisees hate us. No wonder this is happening. What do you mean? For, for, forget our ceremonial, our ceremonial cleansing. This is not going to happen, right? And Jesus says, you don't understand. I'm showing you not just what God is like, but whom God likes, who he loves. Because this kind of love illuminates. This kind of kindness illuminates from Christ. It isn't some that we can just sort of drum up in ourselves, but it has to cascade. It's a cascading kindness from Christ himself. It comes from the Canaan king who hung on a cross of Golgotha. It cascades, you see. In fact, when Paul talks about kindness, he does this incredible thing in the book of Ephesians. He takes everything that Jesus did, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. He takes it all. And Ephesians, he sums all of that up in one word, kindness. All of that is kindness, you see. See, it's a kindness that isn't just a light, but it comes from the light, That's the kindness that we need, a kindness that is not artificial but authentic, not one that just illuminates from somewhere inside us, and we know there's a good person down there, and if we can just do it really good, if we're just trying really hard to be really kind to everybody, well, that's not going to last very long. Let the first person that cuts you off try it. You know what I'm saying? The first time they get the McDonald's order wrong, you have to drive all the way back. You just got home, and you realize they left the pickles. You know what I'm saying? Y'all know what I'm talking about? And you go back, and you're ready, and you're hot, and you're heated. You know? No, you, you need an authentic kindness that cascades, that illuminates, a kindness that illuminates. Well, how do we get that? Well, because we, we get it from not just having a kind of kindness that illuminates, but a kindness that leads. Point two, a kindness that leads. I don't know why I say point two in case there's note takers, which I don't see anybody taking notes, but... <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, okay, I see you. Oh, I thought y'all just texting. Praise God. See how I'd be judging, Lord? Can we just have an altar call right now? Lay hands. I'm just kidding. Illuminate, Lord. <laughs> a kindness that leads. Look at this. Romans chapter 2 says this. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to what? To lead you to repentance. A kindness that leads you to repentance. In other words, it's the thing that when you begin to think about the kindness of God, when you begin to meditate on it, when you begin to let the kindness of God saturate your soul and your mind and your thoughts, you can't begin to think, oh my goodness, I've been so horrible. Oh my goodness, look at it. Compared to that, I'm nothing. And I'm so sorry, God. And you begin to repent. It leads you to repentance. Now I know, I know, I I know, I know. I know repentance in today's society and culture is a bad word because how dare you tell me that I'm wrong how dare you do it right because in our society the only sin is to say that there is sin that's what our society says the only moral absolute in our culture is to say that there are moral absolutes do you see that But let me tell you, repentance is a place where God invites you. He invites you to come. Why? So you don't have to act. So you don't have to perform. So you don't have to display. So you don't have to pretend to have it all together. But you can come to him and say, God, I'm broken and I'm needy and I don't have it all together. And I make mistakes and I mess up and I'm constantly doing things I can never hold together. And I'm stressed out and I'm anxiety driven and I have all these idols and I don't. And you can come to him and repent and be free. Free in that, you see? Repentance is an invitation to stop acting like you got it all together. And what's crazy is when you allow his kindness to lead you to repentance, then it, in a strange way, invites others to lead them to repentance, you see? Because kindness, the kind of kindness that is produced by supernaturally in our natural gardens, that kind of kindness is almost like a high apologetic. What I mean by apologetic is it's almost a high defense of Christianity. 
What I mean by that is this, is that we live in a culture that defines Christianity and defines ultimately who Jesus Christ is through sound bites and newsreels and 15 second TikTok videos. Right, and so they have, and, and, and all of these highlights, and and the Christian Karens of the world, right? All the, all those, and, and through these things that, that we 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 define Christianity, our culture defines Christianity that way. But when you produce, when you demonstrate, when you allow the Holy Spirit to cultivate this kind of kindness in you, then what it does is the Holy Spirit turns a stereotype caricature of Christianity into a relational revealer of Christ's true character. See, it takes a caricature and dismantles it into a character of who Christ really is. In other words, when you're kind, this type of kindness all of a sudden people begin to be, huh, maybe church and Christians and Jesus isn't what I thought it was. Right? Because God doesn't come to take us as humans and say, okay, now you're human version 1.0 and now we're going to upgrade you to human version 2.0. That's not what he does. He calls us to be a completely different type of human, a different kind of human, because, it be, because it's natural to respond in kind. But, but the new humanity that Christ calls us to is we are to respond not in kind, but in kindness. We are to respond in, not in kind, but in kindness. What do you mean by not in kind? We, we respond in kind. We're going to give you the same kind of treatment that you give me. If you, if you come at me, I'm going to come at you. If you clap at me, I'm going to clap at you. If you got something to say to me, I got something to say to you. If you're going to be passive aggressive towards me, I'm going to be passive aggressive towards you. You know what I'm saying? We do that. If you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. If you're sweet to me, you'll be sweet to me. If you, 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 you see what I'm saying? If you got my back, I got your back. If we roll, we got, roll. You know, you know what I'm saying? We, we do this. It's a kind of thing. But, 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 but Christ says, no, 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 no. The, 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 this thing that's being produced in you isn't to respond in kind. So when somebody hurts you, you hurt them. When somebody is unforgiving to you, you're unforgiving towards them. When somebody devastates you, abuses you, breaks your heart, crushes you, you're not responding back in kind, but in kindness. Wow. Wow. And if right now you're feeling guilty a little bit, maybe just a little bit, can I just say this? Write this down. Kindness should not be motivated by guilt, but by the gospel. Kindness should not be motivated by guilt, but by the gospel. Because if it's motivated by guilt, then all you'll do is you'll modify your behavior, but you won't actually transform your heart. And this is what I mean by that. Let's just say, let's just say Beck and I, we're fighting. Let's just say we're fighting, we're fighting, we're fighting, we're arguing, arguing. And let's just say I'm so mean to Beck and I come down on her and I belittle her and I degrade her and all this stuff. And so she runs to Pastor Sherry because Pastor Sherry is amazing at marriage counseling. So she runs to Pastor Sherry and she tells Pastor Sherry all that's going on. And Becca, it's like, I'm ready to get a divorce. And now I'm ready to run to Pastor Sherry because I'm like, I'm divorced. Oh, no, I don't want to get divorced. So I'm running past you. I say, Shit, you've got to save my marriage. You've got to do something because here we are. And so we talk it through and come to find out I'm meaning and I'm degrading towards her. And as long as I'm going to keep that up, then ink to the paper, pin to the paper, sign the divorce papers, and it's going to happen. Becca's going to do it. And so I say, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. Right? Right? Doesn't that sound familiar to some of you? Okay, maybe not. Right. Anyway, and so what happens? What happens? I change. Oh, my gosh. It's like a miracle. Right? That next morning, it's like a totally different person. I'm so kind and soft-spoken and gentle and nice. And, and this goes on for, for a couple days, maybe a couple weeks, to the point to where Becca's like, okay, you know what? No divorce. And she rips it up. Rips up the divorce papers. And then maybe after a month or two, then all of a sudden, I start back in treating her unkind, undignified, condescending, talking down, belittling. What happened? What happened was that all I did was modify my behavior because, because the threat of divorce was on the table and I didn't want to get a divorce. Why didn't I want to get a divorce? Well, you know, I, what, you know the, what, what you say is because you, you love her. That's what you say. But really, why don't I want to? Well, I don't want to get a divorce because what will people think? I don't want people to think I'm a bad person. I don't want people to think I'm a horrible husband. What will the church think? What will happen to my position? Am I going to not be a pastor anymore? What's going to happen? 
Do you, do you see all these idols that are coming up? And so, and so now all of a sudden I'm modifying my behavior, not because I actually love her, but because I'm threatened because there's something else there. Wow. You see? Wow. And so what's going to happen is this, is, is, is that we have to learn not to just modify behavior, but have transformed hearts, not to be ran by guilt, but by the gospel. And there have been many of us who you have served the Lord for years and years and years. You've been coming to church, you've been going to connect, you've been all this stuff, and, you, and all you've done is you've modified your behavior because of guilt. Maybe it was a really good message and the worship was really hot and somebody had a conversation with you. And so, and so because of the guilt, you're modifying your behavior, but you're not actually transforming your heart because you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and cultivate the supernatural fruit. You see, and we do this all the time. We modify our behavior all the time, right? Somebody gets on the phone and the, and, and the phone's ringing, and maybe at that time you happen to be out the kids. You tell them, "Shut up! You guys are so loud. Why don't you know I just hey, ring, 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 ring. Oh, hello. <laughs> right? Modified behavior. See, the motive of your actions—they're leading you somewhere. The question is, are they leading you to be more bound or more free? Well, if you're producing the supernatural fruit in your natural gardens, if you're allowing the Holy Spirit to do that, then it should be leading you to be more free. Not less free, but more free. A kind of kindness that is, point three, liberating. Liberating. What is... What do you mean liberating? What, 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 what does this kindness free us to do? Oh, all sorts of stuff. We could have a whole series on the, on the things that this kind of kindness liberates us to do, but it's getting close to lunch and my tummy is growling and that's the Holy Spirit's way of saying wrap it up. And so I'll just give you a few. Okay. Kindness. Glory. Kindness liberates us to be kind to others. It liberates us to be kind to others. See, when Jesus left this planet, his disciples, his earliest followers, they got this. I'm telling you, they got this. Because, in fact, the very first problem in the history of the early church was that they could not get Peter and John and Andrew, they could not get them to stop going and, and caring for the widows and, and, and making sure that everybody had food, so much so that they stopped even teaching. They couldn't, they couldn't even teach the word of God because they were busy caring for the widows. And so finally, the rest of the disciples and, and, and new followers kind of say, listen, listen, we'll do this. We'll do this because, because, because you need to teach. We, we need to learn more about what it is that Jesus wanted to teach us, and, and you need to disciple us. And, and so we'll take this over. And, and they were like, okay, but, but they were so busy with it. that they, they, they were so doing it. They were so immersed in it. It. Because after three, spending three and a half years with Jesus, after watching him and experiencing him, washing feet and, and, and taking and, and, and serving others, what it did, it, it, it took away all their excuses. It took away all their excuses. After the resurrection, the church got it. They understand that this kind of kindness is a no strings attached kind of kindness. You see? It's a kind of kindness that liberates us to be free, to be kind to others, but at our cost. At our cost. Does the kindness you display either only be displayed to people that you love or maybe even displayed to people that you don't feel any kind of way towards? You don't have any kind of feeling. Maybe it's a stranger. Or is your kindness displayed even to people that have hurt you? That have talked about you, that have lied on you, that have betrayed you? See, at our cost, a kind of kindness that costs. My foster parents demonstrated this constantly. I lived in a type of foster home that then was called a halfway house. It might be a different language now. But basically, um, half of the beds, not even rooms, right, but the beds, half the beds were for uh, foster kids that were going to be there permanently. They were permanently placed. 
And then the other half were sort of for emergency foster kids. These would be foster kids that would be taken, you know, uh, three in the afternoon or three in the morning, you know, and, and they needed to have a bed for them immediately so, bef- so that way they could then place them. And, and so sometimes you'd go to sleep and wake up and you'd have a new roommate. You didn't even know, you know. Um, but there would be this kindness that would be displayed through my foster parents that was just amazing because they would be cussed at, they would be yelled at, uh, they would have their things destroyed, you know, um, and yet uh, my foster parents continued to demonstrate kindness. And some of the things that would happen would be so hurtful and so broken. Uh, we had a kid once that came and grabbed everything I think he possibly could out of the kitchen and hid it under his bed because he didn't think that there was going to be breakfast the next day. You know, things like that, things like that. Um, and it's this kind of kindness that costs. What else does it liberate us from? It liberates us from excuses. It's, it, this kind of kindness makes it to where we don't put a premium on our own position. We don't put a premium on our own circumstance and what we're going through and our problems. It, it, you know, we don't say, well, well, now, God, listen, there's a lot of things going on around me, and it's really hard, and I'm strapped with money, and I don't know how to do this, and, I, and, and I'm having anxiety over this, and I'm worried about that. And there's just all these problems that keep coming my way, and, and, and so I'm a special case, okay? I can be excused from this. I'm, I'm a special case, right? Re- remember how Paul says it? He, he says about Jesus, he says, Jesus came in the form of godliness, but then he didn't turn to his father and say, now, Father, I'm I'm a special case, right? You know, I, 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 if I go down to earth and I do this thing, I won't face too much suffering, right? Right? I, 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 I won't go through too much pain, w- w- will I? You know, nothing bad will happen to me, will it? Because, because I'm a special case. That's not what Jesus did. No, Paul tells us that Jesus never claimed special prerogatives, even though he had the right to every special prerogative. Wow. Do you see that? Yeah. He took on the form of a servant. He emptied himself. What what that means is when when it says that Jesus emptied himself, it doesn't mean that Jesus was no longer God. No, Jesus was truly human and he was truly God. Well, how does that work then? Either he, he, he had it or he didn't. Well, remember the movie Batman Begins? Anybody remember that movie? No? Okay, well, go watch it. And so... What happens here is, this is really interesting, the beginning of the movie, will you actually find Batman? This is great. Where you find Batman is not in Gotham City, but in some mountaintop place in some faraway country in prison. In prison. And what he did was he totally did not uh, take advantage of uh, of the special privilege that he had. It's not like while he was in prison, he wasn't rich. He was rich. It's not like while he was in prison, he didn't have his company. No, he's... Right? And and in the same way, when Jesus came to earth, he came as truly human and truly divine. But he emptied himself. He set that aside. He didn't say, I'm going to come with with, with special prerogatives so I can play my God card when, when suffering comes. So I don't, have to, I don't have to demonstrate this with someone else because I'm special. I don't have to be generous because God, my circumstance is, is saying, listen, I don't really have that much to be generous with. You probably have more than you think you do. Do you see? Do you see how that is? It liberates us to be more like Christ. This is so fascinating. Because constantly throughout the Bible, we're we're seeing this idea that we are to care for the poor, that we are to be kind to those that, 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 that have a need. In Isaiah, there's a place that God says to to his people. He says, listen, you go to church. This is Isaiah 1, chapter 10, uh, verse 10 through 17. He says, listen, you go to church and you pay your tithes and you fast and you give and you pray and you read the Bible. And yet... You're not doing what I've asked you to do when you don't bring the hungry into your home and feed them. That's what he says in Isaiah chapter one. Then in Matthew 25, this is crazy. In Matthew 25, he begins to talk about the kingdom 
And he says this, you can come into my kingdom. Why? Because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was without shelter, you took me in. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was sick, you visited me. And they, they, they said, well, when did we do all that to you? We never saw you in prison. What are you talking about? We, 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 never, we never seen you in this way hungry. I don't remember giving you a drink. And what does he say? He says, when you did this to other people in that condition, you did it to me. And then he turned to other people and said, you're not entering in because you didn't feed me and you didn't clothe me and you didn't give me drink. They said, well, when did we see that? He said, well, when you didn't do it to other people in that condition, you didn't do it to me. See? It's a kind of shown. And it's not because, are you saying, Pastor Roger, that, well, our works is what gets us into heaven? No, 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 no. He's not saying, well, if you would have done these kind things, then you would have, then you would have had heaven. What he's saying is this, is this, is that the, the, the authenticity of your salvation, that this flows from it, that we don't work for salvation, we work from salvation. Our works come from being saved. In other words, we do these things not hoping to get to heaven, not hoping to be saved, not hoping to be accepted by Jesus, not hoping that God will look down and see all of our good deeds and he'll say yes. No, no, no. We do it because we've already been accepted. We've already been loved. He already died on the cross and rose again. You see? It liberates us from self-pity. Notice how many times it talked about pitying others, how they pitied others and they pitied others, especially in the Good Samaritan, they pitied them. But see, we have become so self-consumed and so self-centered that, we have be- that, that self-pity is really what drives us. Wow. Well, if they knew my situation, well, I can't do that because look what I'm going through. Well, I have time for this because I have my own situation. You see, in the Garden of Eden, an incredible thing happened when Adam and Eve took the fruit and there was alienation now between them and God. But what's fascinating is when you look at it, there wasn't just one type of alienation. There there were several types. There was spiritual alienation. There was physical alienation. There was psychological alienation. But there was also social alienation. Because the minute they had to hide from God, they also had to hide from each other. And see, what kindness does is is it brings about, it demonstrates a kingdom that restores social alienation. You see. It liberates us to see reality. As we get ready to end, it liberates us to to see reality. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Remember that? We talked about you know, what's interesting is there is, is there's one way to see this story, and it's the right way, which is, you know, uh, you're, you're the Samaritan. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're the Samaritan. That that's, what you, that's who you should be. You should be the Samaritan, right? That you should be the one that's showing kindness and bringing this person the donkey and taking him to the end and taking care of them. That you are the good Samaritan. But how do you get there? How you get there is not just by identifying with the Samaritan, but also by identifying with the man that was stripped and beaten and dying on the side of the road. See, when you come to a place and, and you begin to see the story and you can be like, oh yeah, that's me, that's me, I'm a good Samaritan, that's me. The, yes, okay, but there's, a, but there's a, another reality to the story that this kindness liberates you to see is that not only is that you, but that's you too, you see. You say, this is me. The person that's been stripped and beaten, that sin has completely dismantled. And I'm a sinner and I need Jesus Christ. And Jesus comes in and he picks you up and he pays for it all, you see. Why? Because, because of his love. Because, and here's the situation. While you were an enemy of him. <laughs> you see that? That's the reality. That's the reality. Wow. What does your kindness look like? What kind of kindness do you have? Does it happen when it benefits you? Does it happen with somebody who's deserving of it? 
Is it genuine? Are you displaying kindness even towards the people that have done you wrong? Are you repaying the hurt that has been brought to you with kindness? I think for most of us, we can probably say no. Does your kindness, is it random? Is it like these random acts of kindness? Or is it intentional and is it ongoing? Is it a natural part of who you are? Today we were having a huddle before service and a lady had come up and asked for her car to be jumped. And so right away, Vince got on top of it and he went and he jumped his car. Now, if anybody here knows Vince, everybody here would know that that was not just a random act of kindness that was random for Vince to do. But that's common for Vince to show kindness. Kindness. You see? As you stand to your feet, I want us to consider something. I wonder if the real reason that many of us aren't displaying this kind of kindness is because we are so bombarded, we are so inundated with our own circumstance, with our own situations, with our own struggles, our own angst, things that have upset us, things that get us worried, that it's difficult to see the kindness of God in our own lives, that we have forgotten not just how God has been kind, but how God is being kind right now, this very second to you and to I. Because when, you be, when you're able to see that kind of kindness, when you're able to experience that kind of kindness, then it'll cascade, you see? It'll cascade. But for many, I think for many people, we're so, we're so blind, we're so covered like a sheet over our face, like, like a blanket that's been wrapped around us. We're, we're so bombarded, like we're, like we're in a cell with bricks and, and all that is is just problem after problem and hurt after hurt and stress after stress and Monday and then Tuesday and then Wednesday and then Thursday and then Friday and then, and then it all happens all again in this job and this kid does that. You have to go to this appointment. We have to get Aaron the tires here and this checked in to come through and now I got to do it and it's this constant 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 to where we're not even we're, we're not even experiencing God's kindness because you're just trying to juggle you're just trying to juggle and keep it all together and get all the pieces in it hold it tight so you don't fall apart and God is saying let me let, let my kindness lead you to a place where you don't have to juggle where you don't have to spin plates where you can let it all break and all shatter and all fall right in for my presence all of it let me see the ugliness and the hurt and the, and the disappointment I can see it all you don't have to act like that for me you don't have to pretend you got you can just come before me and lay it all down and let my cast let my kindness cascade over you i wonder how long has it been since you've done that i wonder if even right now as we get ready to worship god we can come to him not saying i got it all together but saying i don't You reign above it all. 
supernatural fruit be produced in our natural gardens that Lord from this Heavenly Father we will draw closer to you that we will be more like you Heavenly Father that others will see this fruit and because of it draw close to you so that you may be glorified in Jesus name amen and amen and amen thank you guys so much God bless you have a wonderful wonderful day.